Blackstone Launchpad. We help students turn their ideas into a reality. We help students launch business websites, blogs, and the sort. You guys are here because it's launch your business in 10 weeks. Okay, every time I say launch your business in 10 weeks, you gotta go woo woo. All right, so let's try this again. Today is launch your business in 10 weeks. Woo woo! Oh, I like it. So usually we have Pam, our associate director, up here. She stands up, she gets like really feisty, and then she tells you how to launch your business. But we have a surprise because startup does not always go as you plan. We decided to switch this thing up. So we have a student entrepreneur who has launched a business, a very successful business, and is going to be telling you about how to deal with investment, how to deal with an idea, how to pour some beer. And it's really going to be an inside look at somebody around your age doing that. And so his name is Kate, and he's in the back. So he's here. Then we have Ben Potts here, a UCF graduate. Yes, and he is supporting the venture. So I just want you guys to give him your full, his, his, your full attention while he leads this presentation. And I know you guys will enjoy it. All right? All right. Take it away. Hi, guys. How you doing? Good. Good. Awesome. So, you know, you guys just had a pivot right here, right? You guys just pivoted from thought you were coming in here for something, I know something else. But I'm guaranteeing you it'll be worth it. And um, I just want to share a few stories, short little stories about things I've gone through across two ventures that I've found. Uh, one I launched, one we're about to launch, we're almost there. Um, and hopefully you guys can pick up something from this one. So I'd like to start with a picture. All right, so this is a picture of my business partner, Richie, mm -hmm. and um, my name is Kaitlyn, and we went to Vegas once and had a very, very bad experience, as you can tell from this picture. The laptop on the right says, credit card, cash, phone, stolen in Vegas, and uh, there's my partner playing his guitar in front of an airport for money. We didn't have any money. So, we come from very humble beginnings, and the reason I want to bring this story up is never give up. We literally thought we had no way of getting out of Vegas. We didn't even have IDs. We didn't have phones to call our, any of our family. We knew their numbers, but we were like, dude, even if we get money, how are we going to get on a plane? Well, what ended up happening was we ended up staying there for six hours. And we realized that if he was playing guitar and I was singing, and we had two containers for getting money, we were making about 50 bucks an hour. Well. Within a very short amount of time, we actually had enough money by staying there from 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. and then making some more money at a Walmart uh, that was right next to the airport. We had enough money to pay for our flight stack. And um, so it just shows you, I don't know, man, homeless people should buy a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but don't ever give up. And always do something you're really passionate about. Rich and I, we love music. So even though we're probably not the best at singing or playing guitar, People just like to see us having a good time. And it's just a law of attraction. When people see positive things, see you're happy, and see you're going somewhere, they want to join you. And I say this story because Rachel and I have been best friends since high school. And the passion that we put towards our business is what really, I think, in the end makes it succeed. Not the idea or anything else about it. So keep that in mind. Now, to tell you a little bit about myself and my background, um, I was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, grew up in Tallahassee, Florida. Ended up starting my first venture when I went to Babson College in Boston my freshman year, which was Gear Top. We designed high quality wireless audio technology. Well, after I started that, one semester later, I ended up going to the University of Miami so that I could be closer to an engineering team that we had to deal with here in Florida. I was at University of Miami for a year and a half before I came up here because they moved their headquarters to Research Park right here at UCF. And uh, we were doing pretty well until some things happened, which is what I'll share with you guys, which caused the whole thing to implode. And that was around last summer. And then last summer, I said, OK, still love music. That didn't go away. Still got my best friend, Richie. Hey, let's start something else. And we just kept at it. And um, now we've got Jukes. So to share with you, how do you start a venture? Some things that I learned. First thing you got to do is choose a team, right? 
Now, I want to ask you guys, just based off this photo, who do you think this guy is as far as a person? What is he like? What is he like? Stocks. Stocks, okay. That's a pretty good observation. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> He's involved with banking. He's involved with banking, okay. Anyone else? You guys are pretty close. He 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 is uh, he actually created an algorithm for uh, financial derivatives for Morgan Stanley, and then he ended up developing the first ever tablet PC for HP. And he was at Madison College. He was my first business partner. Now those things sound pretty awesome. He said, "Why wouldn't I want to have that guy as a partner? Right? Like that's awesome." Well, he is a pretty awesome guy. He's got a great technical skill set. But the three values that I've learned. Okay, you should look for a teammate outside of just the skill set. Is one integrity. If you can trust that partner. Two, the ability to execute, which you can't get stuff done. It doesn't matter if you're truthful, honest, and you're the smartest guy in the world. It will never get done. And three, the ability to change and adapt in an, in an environment and put out a physical or sorry, a positive force. And by that I mean nothing ever happens the way you plan it. Very, very few amount of time. Actually, have to be He's one of my best friends, Dill. Really smart guy. The problem we had was when we would go out and pitch, and when we would go out and talk to people, and they would ask some questions that he didn't want to give the answer for. Or if you were put in a situation where, hey, you know, this thing is, somebody will come in and say, this idea is bullshit. Why should I do this? You know, but I couldn't respond to you. He would have a very negative impact on you. Our if you can't respond, you fail. So one of the things I've learned by having given as a partner and learning from him because it was my first venture, he had more experience than me. And I couldn't execute then was gotta have people with those three qualities first. Then look at what else they've done. Right? If they don't pass that checklist, well, you're just setting yourself up for failure. And um, so then I said, alright. With the second venture, I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm going to make sure everybody on my team is trustworthy, can execute, etc. So I got that team together, right? Um, to the left is Hugo Cardona, who's our financial analyst. That's Pitbull. It's Pitbull's wife, Mike O'Donnell, who's here at the university. And myself, Richie again, best guy ever, and Pepe. Pepe is the funny one. And um, we came together along with Ben, who's supporting us. Today. We came together to really focus on our next vision. The first thing we have is trust. I've known Mike for three years, right? I've known Richie since freshman year, and I know things about him that I shouldn't know. Then I don't know people that much, but based off of what he's been able to do, his background, and how he's still excelling in the business side of things, keeps an open line of communication with us. And within the last three months, we've built a pretty strong relationship. I trust him. His best friend, obviously I'll trust him, and his wife, well, he got married to her, so hopefully we trust her. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, you know, you got that checklist done. And sometimes it's really hard to tell when you first met somebody, hey, this is someone I can trust. They may be just as passionate as you about your idea. In some ways that you can kind of decipher this is based off of not what they say they can do, what they've done, but what are they doing with you today? And are they willing to put in the time? <coughs> that leads into the second thing, executing, right? And then the third thing, the ability to adapt. It was great being with people in three different situations. We had a one-hour meeting set up, which was supposed to be all business. Well, that meeting, and he said hard stop at 3 p.m. It was at 2 p.m. someplace in Miami. He's like, yo, hard stop at 3. I got to go do something else. Well, I knew that I didn't want to just spend an hour with like, I knew that going into the meeting, so I'm like, you want to this guy wrong. Well, that meeting ended up being, from here, that one-hour meeting turned into five hours at that same location. And then he took us to a club, and we had some fun, and I got to see the other side of him, and how one of the things I knew I knew he was doing was seeing how me and the rest of our team acted in a different environment. Could he trust us in an environment where you've got a bunch of hot girls on one side and a bunch of liquor on the other side. And can he trust us that we're not just going to you know, say some dumb stuff and be idiots? So it's interesting. He kind of tested tested the waters with us, not because I feel as 
he just wanted to have fun, but really because he was saying, could he trust us? So do creative things like that. Meet with someone in a different environment. Guys, if you're taking a girl on a date, don't stay at one location too long. Take her to three different places. If she feels comfortable with you at all three, she'll actually trust you a lot more than she just every one place. So, <laughs> just saying. Right? So, <laughs> so, anyways, it's, it's just trust. Trust, trust, trust. Build your relationship on trust. The second thing is going in and telling everybody about your idea, marketing it, advertising it, is a little bit too early for it. it. Ties into that second thing on the checklist, being able to execute. If I go to the Emmy Awards, which is something I did with Richie and one of our friends, and I'm telling everybody, hey, yo, this was from my first company, Ear Top, and we were selling audio stuff. Buy this audio thing. And uh, I don't have the logistics set up or the production set up or anything else set up to actually manufacture the demand that might come from an event like that. Don't go do it because the Emmy Awards ain't going nowhere. But I look like a not so smart person <laughs> when I went there and advertised the hell out of it, and I got 10,000 orders we couldn't fulfill within the next two weeks. And a large majority of that was from some pretty influential people. You know. So be prepared. Be prepared to execute. Don't, don't get excited by opportunities that may come your way if you're not ready to do them. This is one of many. I, that's actually probably my thing that I had to learn the most was I get excited at everything. I mean, it's my baby. Any opportunity like that, hey, you want to be on Bloomberg? You want to be on Forbes? You want to be on Inc? You want to be on blah, blah, blah? Yeah, sure. But no, wait a minute. You have to look at, okay, once I'm there, that article is published, that we've been at that trade show, that event, whatever, what comes after that? Because that's really what you're looking for. What is the value of that? And can you deliver on that? I want to pause here for a second. Has anyone else ever been in that situation? What was your situation? Oh, um, <laughs> I would say that being involved in an organization, like Project Fit was a poetry organization, mm -hmm. and then we were like, oh, we're going to have our first meeting, but we didn't really have like a room. So once you start telling people about it, they're like, oh, that sounds fun, that sounds fun, where do we where do we go? And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where do we go? <laughs> and, um, I don't know. So then I just like made up a random place. I'm like, oh, in the communication. And at that time, it was a class, so like people were trying to come in, like, this Project Fit was like, no, this is class. It was like, it was so confusing. So we yeah. had to just keep a hush. To I love that example thing. because that's something on your day to day life, right? If you're just not ready for something, so try to be as prepared as possible. And actually, a quote that I'd like to share with you is from a guy named Don Willis. Don Willis was really high up in the entertainment uh, industry. Actually, Mike O'Donnell, the old guy in the other picture, who was his mentor. A Don recently passed this year, but one of the things he said to me the first time he met me was, I can spend 10 days with you giving you business advice, but I'm just going to say one thing. Know everything about the person you're meeting before you meet them. Everything you possibly can. Why? Well, if you know them, you're going to be able to relate to them. If they like you, you have a much higher chance of doing business with them than if they don't want to. So, Apart from the Google search, this guy would go in and do an Intellius search. Do you guys know what Intellius is? It's a site where you can go and uh, look up per people's personal information. They're, you know, if they've been arrested, whatever it is, know everything about them. So I did that for Pitbull, by the way. You know, I, I watched eight hours of interviews of Pitbull, um, read God knows how many articles, etc. I spent like three days prep time for Pitbull, right? You know, but know everything about anybody. If you, even if it's not people, it could be a guy like Ben, who's sitting here today, right? Now Ben's done a really good job of making it hard to find information on it. But you know, I still I was asking around. I asked people around the school before I ever met Ben, because when you meet somebody, you want to know what background they come from, and that way you don't say something that might be offensive, right? So that goes to the next thing. What do I do? All right, well, I trust my team. Here I am. I've covered my bases. I'm not doing anything before I'm ready. But what am I ready to do? That's usually the number one question I'm going to ask. I don't know what to do, but do next. How many, how many people in here have an idea or a project or anything? They've gotten to the point where they're like, I don't know what to do next. Just raise your hand. 
That's a lot of people. So, uh, the true answer to this question, believe it or not, is that there is no answer. I, how many of you guys have watched Kung Fu? Yeah. So, so you remember Poe, the little panda dude at the very end, he like sees a dragon scroll or whatever and just looks at it and there's nothing on it. There is no secret to Kung Fu. It's just, it's blank, right? Well, the reason it's blank is because the answer not only lies within him, but the ability to just go out there and do something, try. Entrepreneurship is one of those things where you learn by trial and error. Sometimes if you don't know what to do, try something, even if it's not right. By learning that it wasn't right, you learn what is the right answer and what you do need to do. And for some people that are extremely conservative, such as myself, I don't want to do anything unless I know it's the right answer. You know? <laughs> and ways you can minimize the risk of making a mistake is, one, surrounding yourself with people that have gone through the same thing, have experiences, and leeching knowledge off of them. I would be nobody without my team. There is no I in team. We've all heard that. Right? So use your team. Use the peers around you. you use any of these guys on the launch pad. Use your professors. These guys have all gone through a bunch of stuff that if you ask them questions, you may realize they know something. <laughs> right? So uh, don't be afraid to take advice. And a lot of times people say, hey, well, I'm just starting up. I've got an idea. What if I tell somebody and he takes it? Let me tell you something. An idea is worth absolutely nothing without the ability to execute behind it. If that person takes your idea and executes it and does it better than you, well, hey, I mean, there is better than you. <laughs> All right? They had more drive, they had more time, they did it, or they had more resources. But chances are, especially in this community, this is a safe place. Nobody in the launch is going to do that. Probably your friends, if you're trying to start a business, your friend isn't going to have that same amount of passion to go out there and start the whole business, execute it, and make it successful as you are. So don't be afraid. Go out there, pitch it, get your feedback, and execute it. That goes to, OK, so I've gone out there, I've done something, and it was the wrong thing. It didn't work. I went and, uh, for example, I created a product which didn't work at all. Well, that part of the product is garbage. i got to figure out why it doesn't work. Be ready to pivot. A lot. The master of pivoting, I think he's still somewhere around here. What's about it? He's oh. out there. Oh. Well, Faladay, I love using Faladay as an example. Because Faladay won the business plan competition with the business which had been pivoted three times from when you pitched it at the semifinal, semifinal stage. <laughs> right? You keep pivoting to make your business better. Adapt. It goes back to that third point. Adapt to the situation you're in and from the knowledge that you've received. In this particular example, this was our first product ever for my first company, Airtop. And it's called Flow. How many of you guys have heard of Beats by Dre headphones? Awesome. So we had created a product which could plug into the input on your Beats by Dre headphone. Not only make it completely wireless, but you got built-in capacitive touch sensors, Siri, voice control, everything. So when we did it, the cost to you would be 60 bucks. So for 60 bucks, you could upgrade your headphone and make it completely wireless. Oh, and we also developed the highest quality wireless sound technology, APTX, over Bluetooth. So that's a high quality wireless headphone for 60 bucks. Originally, our, our design started with this. This was actually our first ever design. And that ended up looking like that, which doesn't really look anything like it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the problem was this, this design was okay. There's one button. If you got to figure out how to do everything with one button, no one's going to remember it all. Right? Other problems were that was too flimsy. There was no way it would stay on the headphone. If I'm running, if I'm doing whatever with my headphones on, I want this thing to be wobbling back and forth. So we made this design like this. Um, the other big problem was it was so slim that some of the sensors and microphones and stuff needed to be a little bit further out from the PCB, the plastic circuit board, otherwise it wouldn't it wouldn't work. So we had to make it a little bit thicker and circular and wider to account for that. These are all little edits, big pivots from the product. Your whole business idea can change. Right? If you find out you're doing something and uh talk to Lori and says, hey man, great idea, but it's illegal <laughs> Well, you might have to do something else and find a loophole. But you want to surround yourself with people that aren't afraid to think outside of the box and uh, come up with those loopholes or 
ways to get around a problem, right? So be ready to pivot. Um, and that kind of leads into Coleman Law number 17, which is where I'm going to let Ben introduce himself, his background, very briefly, and speak on this, as this is his baby. Thanks, Katie. I believe it'd be a really hard act to follow, especially since I'm at least twice as old as every other person in this room. So it's going to be a little tough to relate. But I am a UCF graduate. I am an entrepreneur. I've started a number of companies. And currently, I'm in the process of supporting Kate in his just because he's failed. So he's completed step one in a successful business, which is at least failing once. And so what he asked me to do was to talk a little bit about doing that and just to relate a couple of personal stories along those lines. And I said, you know what? I think everybody that gets into entrepreneurship should look at is Coleman's Rules and Laws. So a list of 30 laws that give you some basic motherhood and apple pie look at business. And if there's something that completely and utterly changed my life, and I'll tell you exactly why right now. I'll do it as quickly as I possibly can. And the first thing I'm going to do, does anybody know of a guy named Mike Wonka? OK, good. So I, I would have been just shocked if you did, right? So Roy Plunkett changed my life. And so he began um, a speech when I was just a little bit younger than you were. And he walked through this speech and he said, you know, my first job after college, I was asked to go and find you Bible where he worked. I was asked to go in and to explore this um, chemical compound. And it was a, a tetrachloroethylene, tetra, TFA. And this particular compound is used to make a modification to the then prevalent freon, which, were, which was actually ammonia at the time. And so what they went in to do was modify it to become freon. Okay? And so what he got is his very first job by his supervisor was to take this tetrafluoroethylene, put it in a container, pressurize it, cool it down, because when you pressurize something, you get something. And by the way, I'm an engineer. So if I talk like an engineer, then you know that's just the way it is, right? So so anyway, he gets his, his first job and he pressurizes this, this stuff and the very next day, what you're supposed to do is take this container out and get this gas of tetrafluoroethylene out and use it to make this chemical. Nothing came. So the supervisor comes to him and says, you know, Plunkett, you screwed up. You ruined this. And instead of bowing his head, what he did was he went and he cut the cylinder open. So I'm listening to him pitch me the story when I'm here. Right? He cut the cylinder open, and what did he find in there? White powder. OK, not cocaine. But what he found inside of this, this thing was this chemical compound that he said, what the heck is this? And so the first thing he did was he tried to run a chemical analysis on it. This is back in 1938. You can't do much of a chemical analysis except pouring chemicals on it. It didn't react with anything. And so the next thing he did is I'm going to heat the thing up. You know, so tetrafluoroethylene is a gas at room temperature. So he says this thing's going to melt at like, you know, nothing. So at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't melt. 200 degrees, it doesn't melt. 300 doesn't melt. 400 doesn't melt. And at 500 degrees, he's getting kind of interested because it doesn't melt. And it doesn't melt until about 600 degrees. To make this long story short, it turns out what he discovered there was Teflon. And it is now on every product that you can possibly imagine. And the way he discovered it was because he failed, completely failed in setting up the experiment the way his boss told him to. But he was not going to be cowed by that. And I took that message to heart. I heard this pitch, and I said, I am going to do the exact same thing. I am going to fail like nobody's business, and I'm going to invest the next step. So I went to work for Lockheed Martin, and after a short period of time, realized that consequences of failure there were pretty big. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go work for this, this, this company, because I found on their web site, which is just becoming available at those times, that they have this thing called Coleman's Laws. And one of them was, the only people that aren't making mistakes are those not doing anything. And I said, well, I can make mistakes, and I want to do something. So I went to an interview with this company. And I, I went to the startup company. And I interviewed there, and I got through the interview, but the, the, the we'll flip to the next slide. Uh, yeah. Next slide takes another Coleman law. One of the other Coleman laws that I, I had learned was the prepared bird gets the worm. I said, okay, look, I'm going to be, what Katie said, I'm going to be 100% prepared. And I went and I studied the heck out of simulation, which is what this company did. I studied day and night about simulation, some of the stuff I did at Lockheed Martin. And so I went in and did the interview, and I interviewed with this guy named Jeff Coleman. So it turned out to be a very famous entrepreneur. And so he had just started this company, and he's quizzing me up and down about simulation. 
and I'm talking and I'm answering all those questions really intelligently, and I realize at the end of the interview, he is talking about missiles, and I'm not talking about electronic circuit boards, and we have nothing in common in that conversation, but I managed him to convince him to give me a job. And I realized this is the place that I want to go work because, you know, shoot, if I can buffalo the boss with something that I don't even know what I'm talking about, this, this has got to be it. We'll make that long story short. I met my wife then. We grew that company to several hundred million dollars. We sold it. He gave me the opportunity to start another company. Unfortunately, he died literally the day we started another company. I grew that company to another several hundred million dollars and sold it and said, you know, the thing that was really kind of inspirational in all those was, you know, not being afraid to fail at each one of these things, not making a mistake to go after every one of these. And so I stepped back and decided to invest in a number of other startups. And kind of as a weird spur of the moment, Dayton showed up and he pitched this idea. And he just mentioned to you one interesting thing. And so he pitches this idea to me and this idea about Dukes. And the first words out of my mouth were, Dayton, that's so cool, it's illegal. And in 15 seconds, he pivots because it's absolutely illegal what he wanted to do the first time and comes up with this really brilliant idea. And what I saw right there was an answer to a number of the questions he's presented. An individual that's absolutely passionate about what he wants to do, that's able to pivot on what he wants to do, that has failed before in starting another company and what he wants to do. And he's going to be successful this time. So I've engaged in this great big experiment with him to go fund another one of his companies because, you know what, um, it's about making a mistake. And if that isn't exactly what's going to be successful, then we're going to make a mistake on this one and we're going to try something else. So there's a little bit about my background and that's how I've gotten to know know things. But yeah, I just kind of back in this whole thing up. This one thing I can do with you guys, but it's be prepared and then those three things, right? Trust, don't need to execute, don't need to adapt, and pivot. If you guys can do that, you guys have a huge leg up over anybody that's never done any of those things. Because those are the things where I'm gonna ask you the question. Do you want to own one percent of a billion dollars or a hundred percent of a billion dollars? Exactly. Be ready to give stuff up as well to get to where you need to go. This is the thing that most I didn't even understand. I didn't want to give up any equity in my first venture to go do anything. And I was like, hey, that's my baby. I don't want. It. Why should I bring you? I don't know. You know, right? Um, be prepared to give up just enough to just enough for the value that you're getting, right? If the value you're getting for what someone's about to do, or the capital about to put in, or whatever it is, it's so high that you literally couldn't do it without them on your team. You want them on your team, right? And know what you don't know, because most of the time, hell, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a guy who grew up in Tallahassee, Florida, never took a coding class, or in my last company we were making electronic stuff. I'm not an engineer. My business, I was an entrepreneurship major, you know? But I knew that I love music. Really narrow down on what you love and just go out there and try to do something. And um, I think any everybody in here has the potential to be successful, just as successful as Brett who's sitting there, me, Ben, anyone. You just gotta go out there and try and fail and get back up. And just so you guys know, I'm not like much older than you guys. I'm, I'm 21. So you know, we can all do it. And it's been done. That's it. That's all I got. We got 30 minutes left. Sure you guys ask anything you want. So, thank you guys. So it's called Jinx, J-O-O-X, and we're essentially trying to revolutionize the music industry by giving independent artists and established artists a way to raise up for capital and engage with their fans in a way that has never been done before. Right now, I'm going to ask you a question. You go to, who's your favorite artist? I was in the notes. Anybody, anybody that you like. G Easy. I love G Easy. <laughs> no, my partner has been telling me about G Easy. Alright, G Easy. G Easy's coming to town soon. Um, you go to his concert, 
Would Jeezy ever know that you went to his concert? As of today, no. Are you going to get anything for going to his concert and telling all your friends to go to his concert? No. Now, what if I told you you could and at no cost? Probably want to see what it is. But there you go. So that's that's the half a juice. We've created a system where not only can you back an artist with dollars and get points, but when you go to a concert, promote that artist, and do some other things, you can get more points that you could use towards actual stuff you care about, rewards from the artist. So a signed vinyl. Um, some big higher tier rewards might be a signed guitar, a signed instrument, uh, the ability to have a 10 minutes of conversation with it. Whatever it is, the other things that, as an artist, I want to know who my number one fan is, who's been going to the stuff, who's been backing me since day one. So that's what Juice is. Okay, well, all right, since I told you about Juice, I'm going to have a question for all y'all. Help me out here. Based off what I just pitched, who would who would join? Alright. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, cool. Um any other questions? Yeah, do you feel like you um you've uh, had a lot more bad luck or good luck during your adventure? Oh man, luck. I don't know if I believe in luck, to be honest. Um I believe that I failed a lot. I can give you that that Vegas story, I gave you like one tenth of what happened. We were broke for a reason. We didn't just get our stuff <laughs> stolen from because, you know, we're some dumb kids. We, The whole story was we went out there to meet, meet Macklemore. I thought I was meeting Macklemore, and the guy who was supposed to make the meeting happen was a friend of somebody on our core team. Well, not only did he not make the meeting happen, he told us he was going to cover our flights. That never happened. He told us he was going to cover our hotel rooms where we were going to meet, and that happened to be at the Venetian. All right, dude, I'm in college, too. I don't have money. I'm not paying. I paid four rooms at the Venetian for three years. <laughs> you know, so I learned, hey, next time I go anywhere, unless that meet, I'm in touch with that person face-to-face, -face, and they're emailing me, telling me, yo, meet me here. I'm not going to go through a middleman. Never go through Never go through a middleman, ever. Don't do that. But, uh, yeah, so we lost a bunch of money, and basically I spent all the money I had before I got there. <laughs> I had, like, $200 in my bank account. I was like... Damn, I just spent like ten grand on my team on flights and hotel rooms and everything. Final last minute. Hopefully, uh, this all come through. Well, not only did he not come through, the person who made that introduction fired. She's off our team. Um, yeah, you don't mess up. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Good luck, bad luck. It's just, I truly believe you are a product of your thoughts. So I think if you always have a positive attitude. Even when things are going down and you're in front of an airport with a guitar playing for money, if you just have a positive attitude, things will always end up all right. That's <coughs> what I found. Yeah, um, what did you initially do to look for money when you were trying to get things started? Well, the first thing that you have to do is not jump to the conclusion that you need money. At some point, most ventures, yes, you're going to need some kind of capital. But you also have to look at it from the eyes of an investor. First, figure out what resources you need and have those resources lined up to the best of your potential outside of the capital. Whether it's a strategic partnership, if it's a manufacturer, if it's an engineer, if it's talent, try to bring that talent in on equity, right? Or some other means to get your team to the point where each person in your team has the ability to execute on something, some kind of specialty, their skill set. But also, you know, be prepared. Have your idea written down on have a business plan. Have all that stuff done. Then when you really feel you're ready to go get capital, you should look first to your friends, family, and fools. You ever heard of that? Friends, family, and fools? Yeah. Right? Cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, friends, families, and fools. That's always the first place to look, right? Because if chances are if it's your first venture and you can't get some rich family member or a rich friend, everybody knows somebody that's got some money, right? So if you can't get your friends or family to fool to invest in you, there is no institution that's going to invest in you, right? So first look there. Outside of that, actually, I'll ask you, are you trying to raise... Uh, well, I don't think I'm trying to do is, like, no person would have to pay a month other than a company or someone really would have the kind of money to do the venture I'm thinking about starting. Okay. 
And I'm not gonna ask what your venture is, but what what range of capital do you think you can do? Fully developed, it'll probably be a few million. Okay. So a few million bucks. Well go to gut, you gotta find somebody rich. Or you get an institution. But before you do that, as I said, be as prepared as possible. Because if you just go there with an idea, if I'm an investor, I'm putting money into something, and when I put that money there, I expect it to grow, or I expect it to be able to execute. I don't want to have to come in and find 10 other partners that I need to bring into the venture to make it successful and do a bunch of other stuff, unless I'm really somebody that cares about the venture and I'm a friend of family. So I would really look at it. Ask your parents. I mean, ask your dad. Be like, hey, dad, do you uh, know anybody that's really rich? Yeah, ask your ask a buddy that you know. Uh, and if you really don't have anyone in your network of a high, high net worth value, then bring on somebody that has really good skill set for maybe building what you're trying to do. Get some kind of minimum viable prototype built and then take it to an institutional angel fund. So uh, at that size, I mean, have you looked at Florida Angel Nexus? Heard of them? Um, no. so you should check them out. Check out Florida Angel Nexus. They're uh, Mike O'Donnell, who's actually my partner, founder of that. Uh, that's what they do. They look at ventures that need funding and they fund them. So, but Mike, you gotta be ready. I told Kate I wasn't gonna interrupt him on anything, but I mean, he, the thing I'm most impressed at is he speaks with a wisdom beyond his years, from dating knowledge to business knowledge. <laughs> and business, right? and you know, one, one thing, almost everybody jumps to the conclusion money is what you need. Money is almost never what you need first. The other thing that he said that's just really profound is, is that an idea is worthless without an ability to execute. So you need to be able to surround yourself with an ability. You don't have to do the execution at, you know, full scale, but you have to be able to do the execution at a minimal viable prototype. You have to be able to answer that question, why? Why am I doing this? Can I get people to believe in my idea? Can I, if I can't do that, then any amount of money doesn't solve this problem. And by the way, people have a lot of money, they don't just give it away for the fun of it. And so they're not going to be playing that game. So you get up to that point, people will die to give you money. It, it, it's an amazing transition that occurs. You know, that goes between people never wanting to give you a penny to they'll fall over yourself. And you know, looking for a few million dollars is totally within the bounds of things to do in the state of Florida. You mentioned one angel form that easily can raise money. So the other one, you guys heard of Sean Parker? Sean Parker, Facebook guy, Napster guy. One quote that he once said was, "Good ideas don't find money." If you have something that's a good idea, and you can show you that you've got some kind of traction behind it, real traction, users, whatever it may be, users, purchase orders, letters of intent, whatever it may be, and you take that to or you take that to someone, or someone hears about it through some other channel. Trust me, they're going to come to you, and you're not going to have to pitch it that much, right? Keep that in mind. Uh, first question: Did you get Michael O'Donnell to come clubbing with you at the Bull? <laughs> uh, yeah, he did um, come out. <laughs> he did come out. Is he your professor? No, I, but I've uh, I met with him through uh, research and commercial He's an awesome guy. Um, yeah, I did. Actually, the story was Pitbull bought us a suite on the water. He wanted us to stay there the night, but we couldn't because Mike had a meeting in the morning here at UCF to move Dean Charlie and. So after clubbing at uh, Mango's until like one in the morning, we're like, okay, we gotta drive back. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a full story of that. I had an actual question though. Oh, okay. Uh, are you still a student? Yes. You are uh, here. Twenty one years old. I'm a somewhere between a junior and a senior, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm taking study? three classes right now. I'm a uh, finance major. Yeah, because yeah, that's basically where I'm at. I'm still I'm a full time grad student now, trying to find. The time to just launch business and lead a team while still in school. Yeah, class. So basically, apart from school and your business, you have no life. I, can mm -hmm. that. I don't do anything outside yeah. of that. You know? Someone was back here. I have a question. How did you? How did your network resources become so great? Like, maybe that's like your when you first started and you didn't know anyone. 
so the first first two things I did was I joined every organization on this planet that I could for a student that's an entrepreneur. Well, guess what? There happens to be a lot of them. <laughs> There's a lot of them. I'll name some for you guys. These are all organizations you can all join today. Power of Society, Entrepreneurs Organization, you know, Kauffman Foundation. Um, Wait, don't get on the board. Yeah. Sure. I got a mark for you. Hey, buddy. I already feel like that's not what I'm These are, so these are actually, most of, I'll tell you what I'm Power Society is the world's largest organization for collegiate entrepreneurs. The whole world. They've got 32,000 members. Been around for five years, and um, their supporters are Bill Gates. Bill, Bill and Gates are the largest sponsors. I actually had the opportunity to meet Bill Gates once, just for that. But that was the former president from the Southeast uh, region. The Car Society International, and you can apply online. CarSociety.org. Um, two. This is Startup America partnership. This is open to every single entrepreneur that's in college as well. They've got a Startup America has been divided into states, and they've got a Startup Florida. And uh, the founder of AOL, Steve, Steve White, I believe is his name, he's the guy that is running this whole thing. The names to know here, and if you guys have LinkedIn, that's what I would say. Everybody in here needs a LinkedIn. I met so many people from LinkedIn. Get a LinkedIn. Look in your LinkedIn network. I guarantee you, if you know anybody in the business college at UCF, they're connected to a lady named Susan Amat. She is the head of the Florida Startup America Partnership. They have events all over the state. Cross Florida's free from the US. Three, um, now the Kauffman Foundation is more, uh, they do a lot of charitable stuff. But they do have events for entrepreneurs as well. So look them up. You can join that. Here on campus, you are obviously at the launch pad, which is awesome, because they do a lot of events here. And you will be seated into stuff like this from the great mentors and coaches that are in here. So launch pad, make this your, uh, you know, your home base for if you're trying to meet somebody or get into something. Um, then there's summits, there's entrepreneurial summits and stuff like that that are around here. Coming up this month, actually at the end of this month, there's something called iSummit. One of my very close friends, Jeff Hoffman, who's the founder of, uh, he's a mentor of mine, founder of Priceline.com, he's speaking there along with the former CEO of Apple and some other stuff. So you go to that. This is in downtown Atlanta. But my point is, look into that community. There's a tech startup community downtown. Um, they're called Canvas. It's a working place they have. And there's a couple other things. If you just look at Orlando Tech Star Community, all this stuff comes up online. And look, I'll just end you with that. But there's hundreds of organizations that are like this. Um, have you been able to um, go into Million Cups or something on Wednesday mornings, Million Cups? So that guy right there is. <laughs> she talked to him about it. I just simply haven't gone because Wednesday mornings happen to be the worst morning that I normally have as far as classes and work goes, and I never get there because I'm at like 8 in the morning. But uh, he's pitched there. Do you want to tell a little bit about it? Yeah, so One Million Cups, I, when I went, it was over at Rollins. It keeps changing. I think it's still over there. But you basically two people every Wednesday morning pitch, and then there's a community of people who just give you feedback and share your ideas, and then you can ask them for whatever you're looking for, and then they'll connect you with any resources they have, so it's a really um, helpful environment. No matter what stage you're at, I think you have to be pretty solid on your idea and have something in the works, but um, you can apply for that online, or if you just want to go out there and listen to their ideas, it's a pretty cool community. What are some good time managing skills or tips do you have? I mean, I'm a student myself, uh, as a senior at the moment, and uh, I just feel overwhelmed with the schoolwork and my job. So what are some good uh, time management uh, tips do you have? That's just get overwhelmed with everything. 
That, by the way, is a really, really good question. And I'll tell you, even myself, I haven't been able to fully uh, manage my time to its most efficiently efficiency, especially when it's school too. Right, because I get so into my business and everything else, and I'm like, oh shit, I got a test tomorrow. I find that out like two hours before the test when someone in my class is asking, yo, did you study? <laughs> so, so I do have to do a better job of that, but what I've actually been using, um, Acuity Scheduling, A-C-U-I-T-Y, -I, I use that because it's really simple, and like, I mean, there's a million scheduling software you can use your phone. I, I definitely have my Google uh, calendar synced to my iPhone so that any event that I've got going on, for the time, all my classes in there as a test, I just put it in. And that actually does help a lot, believe it or not, because without that, my life would be crazy. You know, I've got, it, yeah, it's very, very hard. One thing I can tell you, though, is as far as time allocation towards my venture, I've done the math. I stopped counting how many hours I put into it, but usually I put somewhere between 12 and 16 hours into my venture a day. You know, I wake up in the morning and I'm doing my venture. Uh, go to his place, I'll be working on my venture. I come home, I'm working on my venture till 3 in the morning, wake up at 7, I'm at it again. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, I don't even know what commitment, especially earlier on. And then, um, really, it's, it's a way of how do you build in school and everything else that's imperative. For me, though, I can tell you, I thought of my venture in school, I don't really have much time for anything else. So, my job, I had a job, actually, I work here. Guys knew that. I was a coach here, and uh, recently I had to stop coming in because of my back, and then this venture came up, and now I'm not active here anymore. That doesn't mean I left. I still love everyone here, Ron and Bade and everybody, but it just becomes almost impossible once you really get engrossed in something. Like this. So do you do you believe in spending as much time as possible in your business? Because a lot of people say you should be efficient and spend as least time as possible. I don't know about that. I mean, I just spend. I just tell you, I'm not. You know. Screwing around when I'm working. <laughs> you know, when, when, when you work, you want to see. I always look back and say, okay, what did I accomplish today and what do I need to do tomorrow? And if I didn't accomplish something today, then yeah, you're right. I was jacking off or something. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> you know, but you got to do something. You're, you're right. But I don't believe in spending as least time or most time. Spend the amount of time you need to spend to get it done right. And then move on and keep going. <coughs> How do you keep your uh, team excited, man? You know, a lot of ventures are starting off. Especially if it's something that you came up with and can only see So that's a great question. It's really yeah, good for the team, right? Your team's got to be first off passionate about your ideas, especially in the early founding stages. Because if they're not, it doesn't matter what you tell them. They're only going to look at the money, the number side of things, right? So that's one thing. The second thing is incentivize your team by giving them stuff. I'll give you an example. Everybody on my team, well. Until you met Ben, really, really, really like loves music to the point where they're going to music festivals, and concerts, and stuff all the time. Well, some of our interns, when we told them, they're like, "Yo, you work for us. We can't pay you because we're broke right now, but I'll take you to a fat music festival at the end of the summer." So we took them to Blackwater Music Festival where they saw Slightly Stupid, um, Stephen Marley, uh, some other Dramatic, Grizz, and some other people live, and we made sure they had proper seats. Yeah. Someone else, yeah. Who is someone that you look up to or try to emulate? Maybe in your field or just in life in general? I'll give you two answers to that question. The number one answer to that is my team. I look up to my team. I look up to Ben. I look up to Mike. I look, every single person on the team is there for a reason, and I look up to everybody and I learn as much as I can from that. Those are the immediate people in your life that you I want to know everything that's in his head. I want to know everything that's in Mike's head. Then the other answer to that question is outside of my team, some people I really look up to, my grandfather, who's with me style, um, Jeff Hoffman, he's also a mentor to me. Um, probably a really good business one. I like my service your Branson. I like Branson as well. Cool people. Someone's over here. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Um, where would you see yourself in the next three years? Or where would you like to see yourself? <laughs> I have big dreams. <laughs> I have really big dreams. Um, in three years, I would be happy if this venture, we had made it so that if you were an artist, you knew that the place you were going was Juice. If Juice becomes critical. It's imperative to your life. 
Right. If you don't have Jukes, you're messing up. It's like an artist not having their song on iTunes. There's no artist that doesn't have their song on iTunes. It's like, crucial. Thing. I want Jukes to be a pair of every artist's life. That's where I see my, my venture. As far as myself, I don't know, man. Whatever happens, happens. Yeah, but <laughs> I, want, I want to make a pretty big dent in this industry. I don't know, capital isn't an important to us right instead, but uh, what are your tips on um, learning the financial side of the taxes and paying off stuff? Well, to be 100% honest, I know some stuff from the tax perspective. You know, definitely look into your state that you're filing your business in and look at what are the tax laws that are you know, related to your business as far as income tax or anything like that. But, I don't really get into that stuff. That's for some accountant to handle. Man. So when you're raising capital, the things that really matter is, A, when it comes to the number side of things, are your projections believable? And can you make somebody believe in your projections? Because if they can't, they're going to throw them out the window and create their own thing. right? So try to create the best case scenario where you can use real data to validate assumptions that you build your financials on. Based off those financials, those you know, revenue, whatever it is, create a valuation that makes sense. That's another thing. I, just two days ago, one of the things uh, people was doing with me, at, apart from Juice, is sends me stuff to look at. Other ventures that are pitching me. Said, hey, what do you think? Pop up. That's what he says. And I'm like, okay, well, one of the companies just came by. They had a twenty million dollar valuation, pre-launch, pre-revenue, pre-product, and. Uh, all they have is a really nice idea and a really great team. Well, that's crazy. Okay, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what the upside potential is. Don't value yourself at twenty million dollars when you haven't done anything. So make a valuation that makes sense. And I know that's pretty vague, but watch Shark Tank. That's one thing I will say is, while that's not the real scenario, that's never how an investor pitch goes. The one thing that actually makes sense is pay attention to how the sharks value businesses. In particular, Kevin O'Leary. He's a master at that. So I would definitely do that. And in terms of valuation, it's really based on how much money the investors pay, right? No. Your valuation is based off what you've done to date. And yes, a little bit on what you're doing in the future, but the upside takes care of itself. Okay. Right? The upside always takes care of itself if you have a good venture. Your valuation it really comes from what you've done. What you've done is what validates what's coming in the future. And if you haven't done anything, what's coming in the future means nothing. Okay, so I'm in my <laughs> Speaking from the point of view of an investor, the things that are most powerful are saying you're going to do something and then doing it. And that sounds so simple, but that it really boils down to that. If you said X and you did X, well then now you've answered one of the major questions, which is can these people execute on anything, let alone do it? So that, that's worth its weight in gold. Um, how much time have you spent and do you spend in self improvement and what do you do? So self improvement, that's a really interesting question. All day, every day, every day. <laughs> I don't take time out of my day to go figure out what I can do to be better. What I do is everything I'm doing in my day, people I'm interacting with, whether it's Ben or it's some guy I'm having a phone call with, I want to learn everything I can from them, see what they're doing and what's worked, and try to put that in my life or in, you know, integrate that into my life as best as I can. That's something I can probably do with something better. I read books, though. I'm always, I, mean, I Google everything. Uh, if you look at my iPhone history, it's like all Google search stuff and Wikipedia. Those are like the two sites I live on, literally. You know, when information is just right there. Always Google yourself. I watch Shark Tank. It's the only show I watch just because I like to see what the sharks are doing with evaluations. And it's kind of, I always like to see new ideas, too. Um, but yeah. yeah. When you were starting off, uh, what did you do in your case to put your team together? That's a really awesome. Um, <laughs> that's well. First, you have to identify what needs to get done in your business. What are the key? I, I come from a background of uh, supply chain management, logistics, and critical chain processes. So, okay, what are the critical processes that need to get done in this business for us to launch and have a prototype out to the public where we can get real data? 
they stuff. Then you look at, okay, what the, of all of that, what can I do? And what do, what can I not do? What do I have no idea how to do? Once you've identified that, now you need to go into your network and find individuals that can do specifically that. Because guess what? Just because you were the founder of Priceline.com, what does that actually mean? What skills do you have, Jeff Hoffman? What, how does that integrate with my team and our ability to execute? Don't just bring someone on board because they look sexy. Right. Unless it's Pitbull. Get out of here. Hopefully that answered the question. Someone else would. Who haven't I called on? That is a question. Oh, so, all right, whatever. <laughs> what do you guys? Oh. And my question was just about books. Like, what books would you recommend? Great question. Um, Freakonomics. I love Freakonomics. Freakonomics 2, there's like another one. It's another really good one. Um, Atlas, uh, Atlas Shrugged, that's another really good one. Um, one of my favorite books that actually is not a business book, it's not typically considered a business book, but I just keep relating to it in everything I do in business is The Alchemist. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book. Yeah. It's really awesome. Book. Um, other books, Zen Marketing by Shama Kabani. It's a really good book. She's considered a guru. And yeah, I read that book when I was at Babson my freshman year, and it was pretty eye-opening. Um, yeah, hopefully, you guys still saw it. How do you know when to partner up with somebody or a company or having the right person to invest into what you want to do? So let me just make sure I understand that question. Uh, how do you know when to partner with someone you just mm -hmm. mean like? Like <coughs> companies that are along the lines of what you want to do and stuff like that. Well, when you come into this kind of goes to negotiation 101, right? The first rule of negotiation is both people have to have something to value to each other, which makes sense, right? That if they were to come together, now they've got value from each other, from the other person. If you're talking to Microsoft and you don't have anything of value to Microsoft, well, guess what? You're probably not getting a deal done. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And I wish I knew that when I started, uh, you know, when I started my first company, because I would sit down with all these guys and be like, why can't I get this deal done? It just makes sense. But for me, not for me. <laughs> so, so the first thing you got to do is have value. Right. Once you know what your value is and their value, put a number on that. Put a number on it and now sit down and be like, this is exactly what we can bring to you. This is how this is going to help you in numbers. Have the numbers backing the data. And if you were to partner with us, this is how this is going to help us. And if we get married today, it's going to be awesome for both of us. That's how you do it as a right? uh, Actually, got the beard. I need more yeah. Beer. Um, I know Babson is a leading school of entrepreneurship. What brought you down here to UCF from there? So that's an awesome question. What brought me down here was my passion for my business, and that took first priority over everything else in my life besides my family. And um, family is always number one. Entrepreneurs get so involved in this stuff that sometimes you tend to neglect the people. But um, yeah, that's why I came down here. Now Babson. Particular. I was there for one semester, and I think I got a lot out of that one semester because I was privileged enough to live in an entrepreneurial community called the Tower, where the top 21 entrepreneurs that were undergraduates and graduate students at Babson were living together in an accelerator that was all on one floor. And all the walls were like, I, okay, like I could write on the ceilings, I could write anywhere. And that place looked like a bunch of crazy people lived in there because anybody that walked in, you're looking around, this stuff written all over the walls. And one of the requirements for living there is every student in there has to have their own venture. Well, I was blessed enough to have two months. Like, I was in a room. My roommate to the left was a Business Week Top 25 under 25 entrepreneur. His name was Dinesh Lidwani on a pink light. My roommate to my right <laughs> was a Business Week Top 25 under 25 entrepreneur. He founded Black Blacksmith Systems, which is a security, basically their main competitor is Barracuda. And, um, the guy, a couple guys down the hall were of course, 30 under 30, and they're like 22. So I mean, <laughs> you know, I had some awesome mentors living there with me that still to date, anywhere I'm in in the whole entire world, if they're around, we meet up. There's someone over here. Anybody? 
Alright, um, how are you paying for like your personal expenses, like certain bills and stuff? Like, do you have a part-time job that you save up? And like, what would you recommend for someone? Because I know it's kind of hard starting something when you got something else weighing you down. Well, at the particular position I'm in, I had a job, right? We're very secure, validate everybody. That's what I was doing before an investor came in, right? So pre-investment, you gotta pretty much work another job. Post-investment, if that's really all you're doing, and the only other thing you're doing is school or something like that, it would make sense for either the investor or somebody else on your team to allocate a small portion of that budget or whatever you got towards the living expenses, right? But nothing apart from that. This is one big question that you know investors ask themselves is okay, obviously the CEO of the company can't be worrying about buying money, I mean buying food if he's gonna execute, right? But she also shouldn't be buying a Lamborghini. <laughs> right? So it, the numbers gotta make sense, and in a lot of proposals I get from people that are older or whatever, they start salary of six figures, their first year working on a venture. Well, that's not what you need. You don't need a hundred thousand dollars to live. You can live on bare minimum needs. That's the answer to that question. But pre-investment, yeah, you gotta have a job. When, when making setting up an arrangement like that, uh, how long, what type of figures are generally used? Setting up a like uh, you said, something sort of like a stipend for when she basically work on the business full time kind of thing. So you're talking about a sweat equity partnership. Um, that essentially means that you're putting in the hard work, you're putting in the sweat, and since I don't have money, I'm gonna give you equity in my venture. So if you imagine a pie, right? And at the very beginning, you're the idea creator. You own a, a whole pie. You can eat it yourself. Now, personally, if I ate a whole pie. But <laughs> you want to give away portions of your pie to people that bring strategic value that would be working on this full time, right? Now, part of that sell is you've got to be able to convince that person that the upside of what you're working on is so great. You personally are so great and awesome that it's worth their time and effort to come in and work for essentially no pay in the beginning, right? Yeah. No, but I'm talking about once you get to the that the phase in which it is time to actually look for investors, like you can you can't uh, get as much done if you're working on a job alongside of the business kind of thing. So, so, so yeah, you're right. I mean, one of the questions your investor, I've never pitched an investor who didn't ask, is this what you're working on full time? And if you say no, well then you better be prepared to give up the proportionate amount of equity for what you're not doing. So that the investor can go find someone to go do that, right? Or do no, no, I, I'm, I'm asking. I'm asking more of a, what you were talking about, like, like six figures is sort of uh, ridiculous. But uh, in general startups, what's what do investors type of figures do they generally look for? So it, it depends on who you are, right? It's like what makes sense for your living conditions. If you're a 40 year old guy pitching a venture to an angel capital firm and you've got a wife and two kids. Yeah, you're, you're probably, you're allowed to put in there what would be normal for supporting a family with a wife and two kids, right? Now, if you're a college kid where your rent may be somewhere between 400 to 900 bucks a month and you should only really be spending money on food and gas, and apart from that, you don't need anything else, don't go asking for 50 grand a year, you know? Ask what makes sense. Just do a tally. Well, how much do you spend in a month, right? And if... Your rent plus your food and your gas is uh, two grand, fifteen hundred bucks, a grand, whatever it is. Write that number down. Something like that. It's based. The an my answer to that question is I can't just say, hey, it's around thirty grand or fifty grand because every person is different. Their living conditions is different. Where they're at in their lives may be different when they're pitching an opportunity. But it should be the bare minimum. Tom, that's one of the points in investors don't like putting money into ha having people. It's not going directly into the venture and providing value into the venture, right? And providing your salary, unfortunately, that's not. You know, it sounds really a cold thing to say, but that's not relevant necessarily to the venture. And if the answer is it is relevant, meaning the venture had to hire you, in which case, why doesn't the investor get 100% of the venture? That's just going to buy your time. And that, not what you want to have the outcome to be either. So it's, 
It's a hard, that's a really hard question. It's a, hard, it's a very hard question to answer, and it sounds very cold from an investor point of view, but it actually is really simple. And if you take it all the way back to what is it you're going to provide, what are they going to provide, is it a fair, equitable change of value? Both people get value. If it is, it's a done deal. If you can't make that transition, then it's a bad deal. Just five minutes past one. Yeah. Yeah. So that one more question. One more question. One more question. question. Last question. Um, I know uh, we covered this a little bit, but um, a lot of people say in business, don't ever use your own money. And I mean, I personally agree and disagree with that, but I mean, what's your take on it? You could put it on there also. I can tell you, I put every single dime I had into this venture. I put 10 grand into this venture pre, uh, you know, pre investment. I had my partner, he put 10 grand into this venture. And for college students to put 10 grand into anything, that's not my dad giving me 10 grand, that's my own money that I'm gonna be, you know. Uh, that's 20 grand coming into this venture that he didn't necessarily put on the books, but to go places and do whatever. And Mike O'Donnell, who's our other partner, he didn't put anything on the books, but he put a bunch of money. You've gotta put your own money into your venture in the beginning. That's my take on it. Now, I don't know because I've never gotten to the point where I had $2 million or $10 million or $100 million or a billion to, that's just sitting around to give you the answer to that question. So I'm not at that point in my life where I can answer that question, right? But some people might, he personally never puts any money into his own personal ventures because he says if you can't get an outside person to invest in your company and get that outside validation, then it's probably not about enough venture for you to keep working on. I don't know. Does that answer differs for every person? That's it, guys. Right. Thank you very much. I did do. I bought business cards, so I don't know if anybody wants a business card, but I'm just going to pass them around from here.